Welcome to the Mastermind Live Call. Uh, this will be an amazing call uh, because today we have Mike Brown with us, head of performance at Budeglimt, Norway. You know, that small, small club that plays in the snow and somehow was able to make it to the Europa Conference League quarterfinals, beat Roma in the group stage at home 6-1 and at home in the quarterfinal with 2-1. Um, and I thought there was some fisticuffs as well there, so always good. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about that. For you guys who are either watching this recording afterwards or uh, new to this, just a short kind of recap of what the Mastermind program is. Uh, it is something that spawned from my own uh, horrible uh, coaching career, I don't know if it's horrible, but um, it, you know, the process of becoming a better coach is one that we don't talk a lot about among coaches, especially in terms of career development. You see career development conversations in the branch of sport executives, but you don't see it in the coaching uh, realm. And that's something that I wanna help with. This comes back to when I coached and I was like, hey, I wanna improve. I wanna you know, become a lot better. But where do I go? How do I, um, you know, how do I do that? You know, who can who, who can I talk to? I tried talking to people in my my uh, my clubs at the time, and what ended up more than once happening was that I got a knife in the back. Uh, someone put me in my place, uh, and you know, my career slowed uh, instead of sped up, which was kind of the point of asking someone for help, right? So that is part of what we want to do here. Uh, we also want to inspire, um, we want to be a place where you come in, you listen to uh, great conversations, great presentations that we've, like we're going to get today, and you get inspired, you get some knowledge out of it, and you get to ask questions to the presenter, you get to ask questions um, on the topic that we're talking about, but you, you also get to ask questions about your situation, where you're at, you know. Um, and we'll definitely do it once a month, at least it's a proper Q and A. We're just going, you know, you you pull all your questions together from how your situation is and where you're at, and then you come in, and you know, we'll talk about it. You'll get a, you, you know, you'll get advice from me. You get advice from all the others who are part of the Mastermind program. Uh, so I think that's very very valuable, and that's something that I wish I had uh, when I was kind of working my way up from grassroots coaching in, in Norway to um, one day uh, being in uh, in Great Britain, as I usually call it, and coaching in the Women's Champions League quarterfinal against Man City. Um, so I wish I had something like this on the way. So, you know, if it doesn't exist, create it. Uh, and that's kind of what we've done. So um, we, um, we started out, or I started out thinking that this was going to be a, like a monthly thing because my calendar is kind of full. Um, and then it ended up being a bi-weekly thing all of a sudden because I had Johnny McKinstry on here um, because I wanted to talk to him. And then I just figured, hey, you know, just go all in. Let's do a weekly thing. So we have lined up some pretty interesting topics to discuss. And it's going to be uh, a range of topics. Makes sense that it's, it's football-based. Um, but we'll probably also get some other people from different sports in. We'll probably get people from you know, different realms of the football industry in as well. Um, so it will be pretty cool, I think. Now, um, without further ado, let me introduce Michael Brown. Mike, welcome, uh, welcome to the Mastermind Live Call. Hey. Okay, so over to me. If I just share my screen. Uh, there we go. Zoom calls have never been my strong point, but can everyone see that now? Is that working? Looks good for me. Perfect. So, yeah, like Marcus says, uh, my name is Mike Brown, Head of Physical Performance at uh, Buda Glimt. Quick disclaimer, I'm, I don't know if I'm going through a midlife crisis or something, but you'll see about four or five different haircuts in this. I haven't quite managed what... I want to be, but there you go. So today I'm talking about preparing a team for European success, um, basically focusing on the physical attributes that are needed to be successful. So a little bit about me. 
Uh, I'm a physiotherapist with a background in physical training. So like I say, currently working as the head of physical performance. I have an MSc in advanced rehab sciences, an MSc in physiotherapy, and I'm a PhD candidate studying the importance of high intensity actions in soccer. So those of you might recognize a couple of the badges there. So just a quick history about my journey. Um, qualified in 2009 and did a, quite a lot of work part-time in rugby, which is an unbelievable learning curve. Those of you who know rugby, there's a lot of injuries. Um, so for a young physiotherapist, it was perfect to grow some confidence. I was lucky enough to be offered a full-time role at Castleford Tigers, which is a north of England team. They take part in the Super League, which is the top division. So I worked there for three years. Um, I'm not the biggest guy, so rugby has never really been for me. So my passion's always been football. So I was lucky enough to be offered the role at Hull City as the head of academy physiotherapist. So I took that role uh, during their time when they were working uh, playing in the Premier League. So it was a great experience. Worked a lot with the under-23s and the first-team boys. So for me, I learned a lot there from the top uh, physios in the game that had a very short spell at Notts County. They went through a quite a turbulent period where they were in administration. They're back on the feet now a little bit. So um, I only spent six months there and I was actually approached on LinkedIn and asked if I'd be interested in the role at Buda Glimt. Um, so as with any role, I did a little bit of investigation and after someone had contacted me, two main questions came up and that was, where's Buda and who are Buda Glimt? So I'd never heard of them. Maybe you have now a little bit more successful or well-known, should I say, than we were in 2019. So a little bit about Buda. That's a lovely picture of the mountains and it looks very similar to that now, even in May. Um, so Buda's based in, it's in the Arctic Circle. It's one of two clubs in Norway playing in the top division in the Arctic Circle. A couple of really difficult things we have to deal with as performance staff. Obviously the winters are, so they speak to for themselves. It's complete darkness for six weeks. It's not normally during the season, but due to COVID, it's kind of been, the season's been pushed back. So the last couple of years, we've been playing in temperatures as low as minus 19 with complete darkness, which has a big effect on the players, obviously. And that's matched with in the summer of six weeks of uh, complete sunlight, which for me, coming from the north of England, we're not used to that much sun. So it's really strange. I've got two kids, so I can testify that getting kids to sleep at 11 o'clock at night when it's bright sunshine is a nightmare. So I treat the players quite often like kids, so it's quite a similar thing for them. They're playing PlayStation until God knows when, but it's it's a really something that you have to consider. So these are a little bit of research that I went into. That the experience to be out here was something that really tickled my fancy. So I looked a little bit more into the club. So this is a little bit about who Glimped were. They the highest they'd ever finished was uh, second, and they'd done that on three occasions. They'd won the cup twice. Their biggest sale was a player, Matthias Norman, who's now playing at Norwich. Uh, they sold him to Brighton a few years ago. Um, so that was something that I knew about. So I knew of him from playing against him in the under-23s with Hull. The recent history was they were promoted to the top division in 2017, survived on the last day of the season in 2018. And the pre-season, I was looking to move the family out to the Arctic Circle. They were favourites for relegation. So I tried to explain all of that to the wife and tell her how good it was going to be. And she was obviously a bit sceptical that maybe they'll get relegated. And then is there an issue with funding? So we decided, OK, we'll, we'll come out and just meet with the manager. So I made the trip out. And for me, when you go into any club, it's really important to have an identity and to understand what the manager wanted and how he saw this role happening. So this is a, a typical quote of our manager. And it doesn't matter who we play we play the Buddha Glimp way. So for me coming in as a head of physical performance, it was really easy to go, okay, this is what the manager wants. It's never going to change. We're never going to defend against teams. We're always going to go out and play the way we want to play. So you, I didn't know if it was just a little bit of managerial talk at the time and he was just telling me what I wanted to hear. But I can promise you, even when we've played at the San Siro against AC Milan and we've been to Roma, we play exactly the same. We don't try and play to the occasion they they play exactly the same and that style is is very much those of you who've been to Norway know that everyone's a Liverpool fan so everyone's just copying 
what Liverpool are doing. So as an Everton fan, it kills me a little bit, but that's what what they do. Um, so we're very much the high press, look to defend from the front, win the ball back in dangerous areas. That's all kind of common stuff, win the ball back, high intensity, looking to be robust players. So for me, it was really important to get this stuff from the coaches. These two pictures that I've put on here, for me, looking at the physical aspect, it shows exactly what we're trying to do. So it's bursts of 10, 20 meter speed, all being able to repeat it, all high intensity. So I looked at that and said, okay, this is something that we can work with. So after a few conversations with the wife, it was, okay, we're, we're going to come and we're going to throw ourselves into this. So it really helped that there was that clear approach on what he expected and how we can do it. So for me, when I came, it was, what do we need to do to achieve the coach's vision? The, at the time, the medical and physio department were, and physical, sorry, they were working really well. But I just looked at a way of, can we align that to be a little bit more to meet the demands of the coaches? So to make our work really fit in and really match what they're doing. So I sort of identify, identified three areas that I really wanted to focus on. So I wanted to individualize programs. So that was stuff that people were doing in the strength room and on the pitch, some extra physical work. We noted that if you're going to initiate that high press, that it came down to our front three, we're doing a lot of running. Uh, I've got a couple of friends working in bigger clubs who play similar, so they were able to give us a little bit of insight into who does the most running in their teams, and it was often the front three players who were the signal players into that high press were doing the more running. So that's something that we put a lot of focus on. So really being individualised, looking at players at different ages of or stages of their career, maybe developmental players need a little bit more than senior players who you just want to keep going and keep on the pitch. So that was something that prior to coming in, it wasn't quite as individualised. Everyone just did a similar role. As you know, availability, it's so important to keep the best players on the pitch. That for me as a physio or physio background, that was something that was a easy win for me to look at it, trying to improve. We added in a lot of things such as pre-ab programmes, uh, recovery strategies, what we do in terms of getting people back from injuries is something that, that we approach. For me, I find a lot, a lot of time coaches and sometimes the physical staff are scared of injuries and scared if they're going to happen. For me, as, as a physio, I think it's just it's about embracing injuries. You know injuries are going to happen. You know when the coach is looking for that high press game that they're going to happen. So it's about accepting they happen, trying to reduce the risk where you can, and then just accepting it's going to happen and put everything in place to speed up recovery times. So what I'm going to speak to a little bit more about today is that periodization plan. So the way we want to work is training above match demands. So we look to train around 120 to 130% of match demands throughout the week. So we base that over three acquisition days where the boys are really pushing them. We utilize things like live data just to make sure that targets are being met and stuff like that, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, and the more, most important thing for me is to expose players to situations that they're going to get to in games. There's no point having a right back doing 20 minutes of shooting, for example. We need to expose him to what he's being paid to do on the pitch. So quite simply, just to go through what actually is periodization, for me, it's, it's simple. It's just your plan to be successful. Uh, successful. How are you going to plan these players? What are you going to do to them? It changes to different groups. Um, we've been quite lucky. I think now we've only got two players over 30 and they've got kids. Everyone else are under 25. So it's a bit different when you've got people with other things going on in their lives. Now when we've just got young boys, you can train them as much as you want and they just go home and sleep all afternoon. So that there's no big problem. Um, so it's just having that structured plan, that structured approach to what we can do to be uh, capable of winning the competitions. For me, it allows clear load management. So again, we can look at that positive effect on availability, making sure it's not just when you talk about load management. For me, it's not just reducing players and keeping them. It's then, OK, they're not doing enough. We need to push them harder. Um, I think it's often looked at load management. If you mention that to coaches, they get a bit scared thinking you're going to try and pull players out all the time, but it's no, it's about what can we do to push them to achieve what they need to achieve. Um, and by planning and outlining key sort of structures, you can then enable the club to be as successful as you want. So for me, applying a periodization, it's the same as applying any, any new thing in a club. 
you have to discuss the different options. There's a million different ways to periodize um, for soccer and for football. So it's about buying into what you do. So what we looked at is we discussed it. And for me, the one thing that will make it fail more than anything else is if not everyone buys into it. So we had to have a lot of discussions with the management, with the coaches, with players, with physical staff, with physios, just to make sure everyone goes, okay, this is what we all believe in and this is how we think we're going to be successful. So each training session is tailored to that match demands of the 90 minutes. We set clear physical goals of what we want to achieve on each day. And that's all, again, individualized to what each player is going to be doing. Maybe two midfielders. but uh, So you maybe say, OK, they need to do this much. But one midfielder is a ball player, the one's a runner. So you have to really tailor it, not just to positions, but to people as well. So we found by highlighting simple guidelines, it's something that the coaches can then use as a tool for when they're planning sessions and they can say, OK, it's this day we're going to use this, this day we're going to use this. And it's something we've put out, not just in the first team, but throughout the academy as well. So it's just simple stuff, trying to keep it as as basic as possible, but just to give them guidelines. So we'll go through that a little bit more. So for me, we have to focus. And I think a lot of the times, maybe physical staff and uh, physios don't always kind of see the focus. We're all here to win football matches. That's why any of us are here. We can't necessarily do that ourselves. We have to support the the management that's why i think we're called support staff so we have to do what we can to help the managers coach the players as best they can so for me there's three points to consider so it's recovery so it's an obvious one have the players had enough time to recover when we've been in european competitions we've been playing sunday thursday sunday so it's about structuring that week so then your physical stuff maybe you don't do as much you just it's just about recovery Obviously, for the coach's point of view, it's tactical. So where that relates to me from a physical point of view, it's what do the players need to be able to achieve to do the tactics that the coaches want to play on the game. And then the physical. When you're thinking about the physical stuff, it's okay. Maybe we have three games in the week. So maybe the players, we don't need to run them. The boys who are playing, they don't need to do any extra running or they don't even need to really be on the pitch more than what they need to. But what about the substitutes? What about the non-squad players? That's where I think sometimes they can be lost. If you get an injury, you need to be able to get make sure that they're physically ready to just step straight up. So it's always something to consider. But for me, in the free game weeks and the European weeks, it's all about recovery and then making sure the coaches get enough tactical response that they need. So having a look here, this is how on the top left on my screen, I don't know how it looks on yours, but top left, you'll see the starting players normal week. Um, so this is how we structure a normal week. So terminology is a little bit different, but we'll do game. Then we always have match day plus one off. That can sometimes affect because we travel every game as a flight. So if our flights are the next day, we will modify that. So we will do the recovery that day. So make sure the players have the day off. Um, then we go for recovery strategy, strength, uh, which is more of a defensive transitional day. Endurance, which is where we try and do 11 v 11, depending on numbers. And then uh, match day minus two is a little bit more attacking. And then we have match prep and game. How we do it in European. So it's exactly the same sort of build up in terms of what we're doing in each session, but we just have to structure it so it's shorter. So we go game off, recovery activation, game, recovery activation, game. So that's where you can see compared to the left-hand side, that's where the non-starters and the uh, non-squad players will struggle because they're not going to be getting the big hits that they normally do during the week. So it's really important to make sure that they're getting exposed to physical work. At the bottom, it's some, like I say, it's really basic, but it's a, it's a useful tool for us. It's just what is the focus of the session? What's the normal duration? What's the intensity? What's the focus of the warm-up? How many people in the games? And then what is the, whether we're doing shooting and crossing? I, I always put the shooting in there because that's the go-to for any player, any coaches. They, I always find that they want to do a lot of that shooting work, but it's just, is that sensible to do it on this day? Should we maybe focus that on a different day? So that's just in there. Obviously, during the COVID times, that was really important because when we had limited numbers of people allowed to train, we were on 4v4, so we had centre-backs doing shooting for about an hour. So it was really important for us to actually control how much they were doing and try and focus on what they needed to be doing. So to talk through a little bit about... Uh, how we structure it. So match day plus one, 
for me, that's a day off and it needs to be a day off. Boys can't be coming in. We speak to the social media guys and keep them away as much as we can. Try and let them have a day to be humans, not just footballers. Um, we run a self-recovery process. So we're fortunate enough to have quite a lot of access to really cold seawater just off the coast of Buda. So there's a floating sauna there where we send the boys down. We book it out for the whole afternoon so the boys can go down and they can go jump in the sea, go in the sauna, just have a chance to be a little bit normal. At times they can take partners and stuff with them if it's not busy. So they have a chance to be a little bit normal. What's also, for me, that's the most important day for injured players. We get the injured players in on that day. So me and the physical and medical staff, we're always in on that day. And we work on an individual basis with the players. So we have six members of staff. So if we have six injuries, we work one-on-one. -on -one. We take as much time as we need to really get to grips of what that injured player is doing so we can plan that week. At the end of the session with the boys, we'll always sit down and we'll go, OK, this guy is expected to do X, Y and Z throughout the week. Maybe he's been reintegrated back in so we can then send an email and give a clear guidance to the coaches of what we expect them players to be doing. So then we go into match day minus five. So then we're building up going into the next match. So this is two days post game. So obviously there's going to be a lot of stiffness, tightness in the players. So we go through a gym based mobility warm up. We're fortunate we've got two. Uh, physios here from a Pilates and yoga background. So it's very much a Pilates and yoga based session in the gym. And then we follow that with a, a gentle warm up on the pitch, again, focusing on that mobility and getting a little bit of stiffness out of the players. Um, the duration we look at around 45 minutes. And the focus of this day, it's a restart day. So it's to get players in. We do some simple drills, head tennis, uh, some rondos, just very simple, basic football movements, just to prepare them for switching on for the upcoming week and at the bottom there just the focus is on reactivation without exert, over exerting the players so this is where maybe players who haven't played so much will do a little bit more but again we focus on everyone trying to follow the same cyclist so they don't do any over exerting of that day so that's why we try and limit sort of shooting or crossing drills with everyone on that day so match day minus four it's a defensive tactical focus so it's the first real working session of the week. So it can stretch to around 60 to 90 minutes. We never do double days here on the pitch. We always just do a hard session in the morning um, and that's it. Then we have gym on individual focus if they need to, but it's, it's just the morning and gone. Um, so this is based on short episodes of high intensity. So we keep it really small actions, lots of change of direction, work, um, we try and incorporate a, a little bit of a secret or hidden power session in there, a gym-based one. So we do quite a lot of jumping um, with a repeated sprint at the end of it. So it's an on-pitch warm-up, but it's really a gym-based session. So it's trying to expose them to high-intensity actions in the prep. So that's the way we, we like to structure that. For me, when we're talking about any of these acquisition days, it's always to remember to be flexible for the coaches. If the coach says, no, we're playing a team who's going to be taking set pieces or have a long throw in, we want to be working on that all week, then it's to go back to that original point of it's about winning football matches. So if the coach wants to do it, it's about me and my team being flexible on how we can fit his vision into the periodization and not the other way around, not saying, no, sorry, it doesn't fit. You have to do that on this day or that day. It's, it's about being flexible to make sure we get what we need to do to get three points. So match day minus three, this is the coach's most important day. So when we're looking at availability and planning stuff, we try and have as many people available for this day as we can and manage the load in other days. For a number of reasons, really, in terms of because it's 11 v 11, so you need 22 players, but also it's you get the players on the pitch playing in their actual position. What is important about this day in terms of the warm-up is to expose the players to high speed because you know they're going to go be going into big play. It's also important to speak to the coaches on this one. If he's going to go straight into a attacking, crossing and finishing drill or a high press, we need to tailor the warm-up to make sure the boys are flying when they go into it. Um, we try and limit what we're doing before, uh, before game playing this day to focus on doing as much 11 v 11 as we can. So we often aim for four times 10 minutes or sometimes even five times 10 minutes. So we are, it's a real high physical output on this day. So it's trying to really train the players as much as we can. We have some environmental 
changes that we've put in place. So there's balls on the side of the pitch. And there's about 20 balls on either side. Players have four seconds to get the ball back in play for a throw-in or for, a, we don't play corners, but for a throw-in or it's a change of a ball. So if they don't get it back in in four seconds, it's the opposition team. So the focus is on that real high intensity and getting it back in. Then we go into match day minus two. So this is where the focus becomes on a little bit more about gameplay. And there's another hairstyle for me there. That's a, that was a strange one. Um, so this is where we look at, right, we need to reduce fatigue leading into the match. So uh, the element of fatigue from the previous day, they're going to be tired. So we go through a combined gym-based and pitch-based mobility and fast feet warm-up to act as a little bit of a restart for them today. This is again going to be a small side of game session with high bouts of intensity, but with that focus being on sort of freshness and recovery going into the match, we give them more time. So if it's 30 seconds rest between drills on a match day minus four, match day minus two, it's a minute. So we give the players plenty of time to recover so that it's more about quality leading into that match. And match day minus one. So this is the activation. So this is, for me, this is, over to the coaches. If they want to do something that's going to win games, fine, but stick to the 45 minutes on the pitch is an absolute max. Like I say, be really flexible. If you tell players not to do shooting and crossing day before a game, you're not going to last very long because that's what they want to be doing. So it's just about, okay, if someone is coming back from a hamstring injury, let him do what he needs to do, but no more than he needs to do. So explaining to the coaches, okay, he's limited to this amount. Working with him, being, being a presence out there to say, okay, I think that's enough now in you come. Understand when he says, no, I want to do two more. No one wants to finish on a kicking the ball into Rosette. So if he's done that, then let him. So I had that good feeling going into it. But the constant focus needs to be on freshness, needs to be on the boys being ready to play the match. Um, for me, I like nothing better than seeing the boys smiling the day before a game. I think it carries good energy into the match, making it as fun as you can, making people look a bit stupid at times or just having some fun. Sometimes I'll join in in the squares there. So then I'll be the one looking stupid, but it's just to give boys a little bit of energy and stuff like that. So it's, it's really important to make it fun. Then match day, uh, I think it's becoming a little bit more popular now, but we always do an activation session uh, six or seven hours before kickoff. We'll have the boys on the pitch home and away. And that will be a simple, that's just a session led by myself and the physios. So we'll come in, we'll do a couple of rondos, we'll maybe play some two-touch, we'll have a stretch, and then that's done in 30 minutes. So we always like to get them in. We found it it's really successful away from home when you're staying in a hotel and the boys are, they don't know what they're doing, if they're not comfortable in their beds or sleeping or whatever, but it gives them a focus to, right, you're up, you have breakfast, you go train, then you come back. It gives a little bit of structure to the day. It also gives you an opportunity to train the players who are not in the squad for that day. So we get them in, we run them quite hard. So we try and replicate match day sort of numbers from them in that session. So then they can follow the periodization plan for the rest of the week. As probably most teams, we have pre-match meal three and a half hours before, medical prep 90 minutes before, and then the physical warm-up 35 minutes before kickoff. After the game, everybody runs unless they play more than 45 minutes. So if they come on at halftime, they still run. They still do the top up. We utilise um, the live data to ensure what we want to do. Everyone has their set targets. Everyone understands what they want to do. It's, it's a hard sell. If we've just won and the boys are really happy and they're getting ready to celebrate and I'm coming around saying, come on, you've got two lengths of the pitch to do for me. It's a hard sell, but it's something that really, for me really benefits the players and then just means that you're not playing catch up for the week, that everyone is then just following that same periodization plan where you can do. So the effects of the periodization plan and when it was put in place, it's hard to see how it's working. For me, our availability was something that was an easy thing to look at, an easy thing to assess. So this is our availability differences. So training availability in 2019, you can see it's 78%. And last year was up to 89%. And that's full training availability. So we do have players who are modified training, but we just look at pure full training, can do everything. And then match availability. Obviously, 2019 there is at 87%, and then it's up to 96 and 92 there. So obviously, it's, it's made a big effect. It's made a big change having players on the pitch. 
a little bit of feedback. That's just some quotes um, from people in the media out here talking about us. We have the reputation of being the fittest team in Norway, which I think is a psychological benefit. If teams come and play against us, they know that the boys are not going to stop running. So they're already expecting a tough game before they even arrive, which for me is perfect. You can see there last season ranked as the number one for progressive runs. Um, and it's quite a drop off there to the second team. And we're sort of, it's nice for me as a physical staff to see that people are actually putting value in, okay, one of the key elements is running and the amount of running that we're doing. So for me, that's really nice to read. A little bit more structure, like I said, it was, we were favourites to be relegated in 2019. We actually finished second, qualified for um, the Europa League. That should say broke the record for sales. Um, and we did that with 40% homegrown players. As always, when a smaller team gets successful, we lost two or three of our top players after that season. Again, there was kind of talk that we'd be a mid-table team. But 2020, we sort of blew the league away a little bit. And you can see some of the main uh, records that we've broken. The league winner by largest points, largest ever points tally. First team to score in every game. So we were really a really successful year. Um, I think, in my opinion, the coaches will most likely disagree with me. But in my opinion, that's the season that we... Um, it was the COVID regulations at the beginning of the season. So I think we really got that right. And we were the fittest team by miles for the first 10 games. We went unbeaten for the first 10 games and the boys were flying into everything. So that made a real difference that we were able to get that good foundation of an extra two months where you weren't allowed to touch a ball really. And it was just running. So I loved it. Players hated it. But for me, it was, it was a perfect way of getting that good fitness. And we put people in groups. So we had the fullbacks in, the centre-backs in, all coming in at different periods. And we were really able to sort of focus on physical attributes of that position. So it was a, a really good, successful year for us. Again, we lost a lot of players at the end of that season. Two of our key signings, um, they left on, we sold one player to AC Milan. A guy left and went to Watford in the Premier League. So this is the sort of calibre of players that we were losing. But last year we were, as Marcus mentioned, we had some good results in Europe, got through to the group stage for the first time in the club's history. We beat Jose Mourinho's team 6-1 at home. As Marcus mentioned, they got the revenge of a 4-0 win at their place and they knocked us out of the uh, in the quarterfinal stage. But we beat uh, Celtic and AZ Altmar. The most satisfying thing for me is that it was done in pre-season. So our season, for those of you who don't know, runs from April until December. So in this knockout stage of the Conference League was in February and March. We weren't playing competitively in Norway where teams like Celtic and AZ Altmar were playing in Holland and they were in the middle of their season. So they were really sharp and fresh. So it was about us trying to meet their standards and match it quite quickly, which we were able to do. And of course, we retained the Norwegian title for the second time. So it was a successful season. And yeah, that summarises everything. So thank you for listening.